So far, the Big East has four teams. Miami, Syracuse, Virginia Tech, and Boston College that have six victories and are bowl eligible. With Pittsburgh at four and five and playing their best football of the season, it looks like the conference will have five teams that will make it to postseason play. If Miami wins today against Syracuse and next week against Washington and then close out with a victory at Virginia Tech, then they'll be playing in the Rose Bowl against either the Big 12 champion or the University of Florida. The second selection heads to the Gator. And in all likelihood, Syracuse will head to Jacksonville for a battle with the ACC's number two team, which should be Florida State, unless the Knowles lose to Georgia Tech. Could it be possible the Orangemen would have the Heisman Trophy winner on their team? Paul Pasqualoni thinks at least they should have a shot. The definition of the guy who wins the Heisman Trophy, the best college football player, okay, who has a tremendous impact on the success of his team, then Dwight Freeney should be on the list. Third in the Big East heads to Phoenix to play in the inside.com bowl. At this point, Virginia Tech would make the journey across country. One more game would do a lot for Frank Beamer's club, and especially their talented freshman running back Kevin Jones, who rushed for 155 yards last week. The fourth place conference team heads to Nashville to play in the normally frigid Music City Bowl, which brings up some motivation for the Boston College Eagles. If Tom O'Brien's club can move into third place, it will spend late December in 70 degree weather instead of the cold temperatures they would face in Nashville, Tennessee. If Pittsburgh can win both games against West Virginia and UAB, then they'll most likely play in the Tangerine Bowl against the fourth or fifth place ACC club. What's been the key to Pittsburgh's three game winning streak? Walt Harris says it's a combination of things, but definitely team oriented. I think the difference is they've been given uh, firsthand information that when you uh, turn the ball over, give up long plays, run or pass, and do not control the run, uh, you have no chance of winning. Coming up, we'll be back to check out the scores and highlights from other games nationwide. Don't move. The Discover Card Halftime Report continues right after this. What can you learn at Boston? Milestone tonight. Rangers winning for the seventh time in eight games, beating Atlanta at the Garden. In the second, Mike York with the steal, passes to Lindros, who scores his 300th career goal. Flurry goes and gets the puck from the linesman. Lindros celebrating by the Rangers bench. Third period now, Lindros again scores, second of the game on the backhander, 5-2 Rangers. Got to say it was number 88's night. A blast, the hat trick. 12th hat trick of his career. Rangers flying. All the hats on the ice, they win it 6-2. to two. Carl Reuter saw it all at the Garden. It's always nice to, to score goals, and uh, uh, I've played with some great players and uh, had the puck put on my stick uh, and terrific opportunities, so it, uh, it feels good. And obviously a huge milestone, and uh, it's great for him, and uh, he's, just, he's been nothing but uh, you know, great for this team, both on and off the ice. You're looking real good out there. Are you, are you as comfortable as you could possibly be? Things are, uh, things are really improving. Uh, we're moving, we moved the puck pretty well tonight. We got the puck to the net. <laughs> Chemistry that he has with Lindros and York. I think it was a big one for us tonight. Uh, obviously, we, uh, you know, last time we played pretty well defensively. We got some good goaltending. We just couldn't put the puck in the net, and it seemed to be the case the first period of the night too. But uh, you know, we kept going, kept you know, shooting the puck at the net, and uh, good things happened. The more we play with each other, you know, the more we get used to each other. But uh, we're we're talking on the ice a lot, and uh, that's helping us out. The Mike, is it getting period. to the point where you guys know where you are on the ice with you know just feeling each other out there? Yeah, you always want to take a, a you know a look just to make sure. But uh, you know, we're definitely getting used to each other. The fly line of Fleury, Lindros, and York will look to continue its magic and wizardry when the Broadway Blues are right back here at the Garden this Tuesday night hosting the Colorado Avalanche. From the Garden, I'm Carl Reuter for Sports Extra. New Jersey Devils were a 9% of his games in New York despite the Knicks winning six of their last eight and despite having the second best defensive team in the entire NBA. Van Gundy will be replaced by Nick assistant Don Chaney, who will coach the Knicks tonight against the Pacers in New York. Let's look back at Van Gundy's eventful career in New York. Takes over March 8, 1996 for Don Nelson. Two days later, set game as coach. The Knicks beat the Bulls 104-72. Just one of 10 Bulls losses that season. The year they won 72 games. 1997 Eastern Conference Semis, Game 5 Miami. You remember this. Charlie Ward, Rudy Poo, SmackDown with P.J. Brown fight ensues following suspensions Miami would go on to defeat the Knicks in seven games 98 Eastern Conference quarters game four holding on like Piglet holding on and Winnie the Pooh in the blustery day it's Zoe's leg 
New York would win in five games, but later lose to the Pacers in the semis. 99 Eastern Conference quarters. Game five, Miami, Allen Houston's winning runner. New York beats Miami in five. Van Gundy's Knicks become the first number eight seed to go to the finals. But the Spurs beat the Knicks in five games to win the NBA championship. 2000 Eastern Conference Finals, more disappointment. Reggie, Squish, Miller defeat the Knicks in six. Denying New York a return to the finals. Last season, January 15th, Marcus Camby at Danny Ferry. Boom! Inadvertently headbutts Van Gundy. Van Gundy needs stitches. Just a flesh wound. He would leave. Then in the first round of the playoffs against Toronto, Vince Carter. And the Raptors defeat the Knicks in five games after the Knicks took a 2-1 series lead. Time now for more on this situation. Jeremy Schapp, as we mentioned, Jeff Van Gundy replaced by Don Chaney. Take it away. Well, John, actually, John, today he was asked, Jeff Van Gundy, what his legacy will be as the Knicks coach. And he said perhaps he'll best be remembered as an inadequate peacemaker in brawls among big men. As you said, Don Chaney is going to be coaching the team tonight. Uh, there's no word yet if he's going to get the job for the rest of the season. But for tonight, anyway, he is the Knicks interim coach. The emotions are sort of mixed because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to miss my friend. And uh, it was quite a surprise. The timing, I guess the timing is never correct. But uh, we've been together for seven years, and that's something that you don't just dismiss. I don't want guys to disappear on me. So uh, we want our guys to stay competitive. We want to win basketball games. But for the most part, we want to play hard and be consistent. Cheney said he will be meeting with Knicks President Scott Layden tomorrow. We expect to hear from Scott Layden in just a few moments here at Madison Square Garden, John. Jeremy, I want you to, uh, to tell the story you told me this afternoon when uh, Jeff Van Gundy was a player back in college. Well, it tells you a lot about who Jeff Van Gundy is. And he said he gave up this job because he has lost that laser-like focus. 20 years ago, as a freshman at Yale, he lost a lot of the playing time he had had. He decided, I've had enough of Yale. I'm transferring to a junior college. He said that was a tough decision, not as tough as the decision he made yesterday, but he said it was a much tougher decision on his parents 20 years ago when he transferred from Yale to a JUCO. And then quickly, Jeremy, the why, the when, the future, kind of wrap all that us for us in one package here. Well, he really said that even over the course of the offseason, he was having some trepidations about coming back and doing the job this year. He had to have Scott Layden talk him out of resigning at that time. He said, though, when the Knicks beat the Bucks, a big road victory just a couple of weeks ago, he felt at that time he was not as enthusiastic as he normally is about doing his job. And without that enthusiasm, without that excitement, he could not do the job to the best of his abilities the way that he has done this job for six and a half years. And then yesterday he had a bad practice, one of those practices that coaches say they have only once in a while. He's, his level of frustration rose exponentially, and that was it. All right, Jeremy, when Scott Layden comes up, we'll get back to you in New York. Thanks a lot. Thanks, John. You know, we'll, we'll inform you as, as when we make a decision. I'm happy in that I, I get an opportunity uh, to coach, but away from that, I'm really sad and that I'm losing one of my best friends. So life goes on without Jeff Van Gundy, who says he will remain a fan of the New York Knicks. And I'm not going to paint myself in orange and blue and be in the front row, but I'll, I will be there. Uh, I, will be, uh, I will have great rooting interest in their success. So interim head coach Don Chaney gets thrown right into the fire tonight, hosting the Pacers, and the Knicks came out ready to play for the new head coach, leading by as many as 17 points, but things got close late in the fourth quarter. Knicks trailed 98-96. Mark Jackson hits the three-pointer in the clutch to put the Knicks up by one. Next time down the court, it's going to be off the miss. Marcus Camby, the rebound and the finish. Camby, 18 points, 22 rebounds as the Knicks hold on to win without Van Gundy, 101 to 99. Championship St. John's, a 2 0 winner over Southern Methodist. Congrats to the Red Storm on its way. Brett Favre to a Favre take a dive to let Strahan do it with the game well in hand for the pack. Favre rolled towards Strahan's side, went down. Strahan slid over him for his 22nd and a half sack of the year, breaking Mark Gastineau's record. The first time Favre touched the ball, he rolled Strahan's way. Stray couldn't catch him, and Favre completed the pass. Strahan in hot pursuit of the Packers quarterback throughout the game. Couldn't get to him, though. And after this play, Favre and Strahan exchanged some work. It wasn't all about uh, the record and all that stuff. It was 
we talked about him coming to my golf tournament again, and uh, <laughs> um, I just told him numerous times, as everyone else has, what, what type of year he's had. Stray did get to Favre one time early in the game, but it was after Favre threw a pass, and they both had a chuckle after it. Unfortunately, we didn't do that well uh, as a team, but him personally had a wonderful year. Uh, he's a great leader for us on the field, and he deserves everything he gets. What Stray got today is a lot of near misses against Brett Favre. He got the record, though, when the game was won by Green Bay and Favre went down, and Stray with the record-breaking sack. I was, I was excited for him, and I was a very classy gesture on Green Bay's part, Brett Favre's part, and he deserved it. So the guy had 21 and a half, so you get one like that, he deserves it. It sure looks like Brett Favre went down to accommodate Strahan, but Favre sure wasn't owning up to it. It looked like I kind of clipped Michael on that one, but uh, it was just a keep pass, and just like the last play of the game. Strahan was elated with his record-breaking sack, tossed the ball high up into the air, and when the game was over, the first guy he sought out was Brett Favre. Hey, you had a great year. Thank you. I know your team, I know you were team was a little better, but that's all right. Well, we Things like that happen. You can't, hey, you play great. Good luck in the playoffs, all right? The guy whose record he broke, Mark Gastonaw, saw it all at Giant Stadium. Records are made to be broken, and a record was just broken by an awesome human being. Yeah, I appreciate you deserve it, man. man. Thanks, man. Michael, right. congratulations. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen you quite like as you were today. You know what? Yeah, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. There's something that um, you hope you get, something I never thought of, but it happened. And um, I'm extremely happy. You are shocked when he went down there like that. Well, said, you know you what? Know. They've been running those those boots on me all day. And Brett, he get, gets rid of the ball quick. And um, well, yeah, very shocked. Well, did he go down or not? But he got the record. Season of junior college transfer Marcus Hatton of St. John, the elder of the first year point guard. Hatton leads his team in nearly every statistical category, not to mention jump starting a rebuilding Red Storm program into what is now a contender for the conference crown. Hatton forces the shot over Stalker, hits it with eight seconds left. Next up, we'll check out some Big East scores. Top 25 action from today as we continue. Alamar. Mr. Alomar, this is Mr. Alfonso. Mr. Alfonso, this is Mr. D'Amico, greatest pitcher ever. Mr. Bernitz, Mr. Cedeno, nice to have you both back. Perhaps you could show Mr. Estacio, who is new here, the training room. Or better yet, how to avoid it. And now that you've all met, we're hoping that you can lead the Mets. Peter Gammons on spring training handshakes, New Yorkers are hoping will turn into World Series hugs and kisses. After a winter of recasting the Mets into a Broadway all-star review, the new marquee producers worked out for the first time. Mo Vaughn, the hit dog, who averaged 35 homers a year before missing the 2001 season with a ruptured tendon, joined Robbie Alomar, 11-time All-Star, and arguably one of the game's best all-around players. As fans rim the practice field, they added to the opening sizzle by hitting in a group with the Mets' reigning star, Mike Piazza. We don't need to retreat to, to understand what we're trying to do here. You know, uh, we got some business to take care of, and, you know, we got the talent to do it. I think that, that Robbie and Mo from what I gather, and I'm very anxious to see for myself, understand the difference between right and wrong on the field, uh, in the dugout, in the clubhouse, and uh, if they can, if they could share that wisdom, uh, we'll all be better because it's great. Hopefully, uh, uh, I can do what I've been doing for the last 14 years that I have played in the big leagues, and uh, uh, continue to be unselfish, and continue to play for the team and not for myself. After a season in which they were last in the National League in runs and their first basemen were dead last in the majors in homers, the Mets have interjected Alomar's multidimensional offensive skills and Vaughn's power around Piazza. This lineup right here, you don't have to worry about going out and doing it yourself. You're going to run into somebody's barrel each night, you know what I mean? And, and you got some guys that cause some havoc at the top of the order, at the top of the order with some speed. It's going to be make, make it tough on some teams to, uh, to pitch to us. The last time the Mets went into spring training with this kind of buildup was 1992, when the Jeff Torborg, Bobby Bonilla Mets turned into a 72 and 90 mess. But Vaughn and Alomar, who's played in 58 postseason games and has two World Series rings, have dealt with expectations most of their careers. 
we know that the expectations are high, and I'm glad that the expectations are, are high because that's what we want to be. With that mix, you know, not only do you have talent, but you have good, good characters on this team, so we're going to be fine in that area. Thank you, Peter. More baseball now that the Twins have beat back control. Brings players to St. John's to play the game. Let's find out. There are multiple professional teams in New York, yet there's only one college basketball team. There is no split Mets and Yankees. You Jets or Giants. You Rangers, Islanders, maybe Devils. It's St. John's. One of the reasons why I came here was because St. John's is New York, and New York is St. John's. I mean, the two, there, there is no separation. I mean, you know, I tell people all the time that if you want to, if you're going to go to college in New York, there's only one school here, and that's St. John's. And the reality is, when people think of college basketball in New York, they think of St. John's, and rightfully so. I like the lights and cameras and all that, the fame that comes with it. So um, I think that attracts me more having the chance to play in Madison Square Garden in front of a lot of a lot of people. So I think that was the main thing I um, attracted to, and plus me feeling comfortable here. I think that just kind of just the two together was um, what made me come. St. John's always maintained their status, going way back to the wonderful life back in the late 20s, early 30s, and all the way up to the present day. They've always maintained their quality. A program that was respected not only here in the metropolitan area, but nationally. I can remember being in the service, World War II, and guys saying, oh, St. John's, yeah, yeah, I know that. Play in Madison Square Garden. Back then, we had the reputation. We were the New York City's team. Tradition is, is, is wonderful because it, it gives you memories and things to reflect about. It also keeps you aware of, of what we have to do to continue the tradition. So for me, at St. John's, we've had run our tests, some spectacular plays against Duke in the Garden. As a fan, sitting in the Madison Square Garden watching Ron Rowan hit a buzzer beater and Walter Berry busting back to make sure he can board Pro Washington and, and win the Big East Championship. Again, here at St. John's, in my time, you know, I think of, of, of Bootsy Thornton and the net not even moving in Cameron and him beating Duke and how spectacular that was. When I first came to St. John's, I'm flipping through the media guy, Chris Mullen, Malik Silly, Walter Berry, Mark Jackson. We have a lot of great players. I didn't realize he was like in the top five and winning history in NCAA, and that's big. It was like a no-brainer for me to just come in and walk on or whatever. So, I mean, I turned down scholarship, but just knowing the family atmosphere they have here, I wanted to be a part of it. It's all what I, what I thought it would be. Once I got here, I started like learning about the older players that I've been in, such as Walter Bragg, Chris Mullen, all those type of guys. The tradition of this, you know, I mean, it just goes back way back, and these guys stick together as a family. I'm a New York City guy, you know. I've traveled a lot. There was no place like New York City for me. And St. John's is a great Catholic university. I could get a great education. I wasn't going to pass it up. I met a lot of people just from just walking down the street. Hey, you play for St. John's. I graduated from St. John's a long time ago. You know, these are wealthy people too, and that makes me feel good. Like, hey, if basketball don't work out, I have a chance to make money doing something else by getting a good education. So many of the people that work on Wall Street are St. John's people. Uh, the majority of the people in New York identify with St. John's because most of the first you know, generation that graduated from college uh, graduated from St. John's. I mean, so, you know, there is a love affair that exists between New York and St. John's. It's family. It, whether it's, it's Ron Artest and LeVar and Zenden coming to, to support us at, at a game in the Garden against Connecticut, that's what St. John's is about. You know, there's a reason that, that coach says we are St. John's and the team says that. There's a reason for that because it, it, it is we. We are St. John's. 165 pounds that big things come in small packages. Oh, so far he's had a, I think he's had a fantastic start. Here's Hatch. He is not afraid to put it up. You know, he comes in with the reputation of being pretty much a scorer, um, you know, all different ways, but I didn't realize he had the potential to be such a good point guard. Hatch shakes free. Down low, Jaquita. Spun it in. And he brings a different tangible than your normal average point guard. Leads for Hatch for three. His team leading 24. I would take to the win. If it's scoring, I had to score. If it's setting somebody else up to score, 
get that done. If it's rebounding, get that done. If it's defense, get that done. Whatever it takes, I mean, I'm just going to do it. At pull up, and it's a three. Got it off the glass. Huge bucket for Marcus Hatton. Gets the ball back from Stanley. Ball fake and an open jumper. Boy, is he smooth. Wow. Pretty play. And half lost it. Wright's giving chase. Forget about it. Ooh. Send it in. He can score. Everybody knows he can score. But he, he sees the floor. You know, he's, and he's fearless. I believe in all my teammates. I have things that they can knock down any shot. So I seen him wide open. I knew he can hit it. Yeah, he's a better passer than I pretty much thought. Because sometimes when you drive to the lane, he might do something. Like, you don't even think he's seen you, but he'll hit you anyway at the same time. He's a great player. He's done very well. And he's done even he's done much better than I thought he ever would at the point. He's, but he's a good basketball player. Don't worry about whether the guy's a point, a one, or a two. Is he a player? Is he a good basketball player? And you know, a couple years ago, we almost went to the Final Four with five good basketball players. And uh, so you need good basketball players. He's a good basketball player. And that time out, Hat pull up, top of the circle. Foot was on the line. Oh, oh, two. Man, I am telling you, this kid is unbelievable. Have a four-point lead at the 5:40 mark. Hat with the left hand. Here he comes. It's crunch time. He's not afraid to make the. The, you know, the, the spectacular play or the, the impossible play. That's the guy with the ball. Second. Hatton forces the shot over. Snowden hits it with eight seconds left. All my life I've been at the score since I was about 12 years old. That's all I like. I like to score. So um, mainly um, I like to go up against the best defenders and see how I hold up against them. The kid's got so much confidence in his game, and uh, obviously we have a lot of confidence in him. He's got the talent to do it. And he's, you know, consistent. So he's doing it every night. He's giving us like 19, 20 points, plus distributing like four or five assists, and he's playing the best guard on the other teams. They turn it over, here's Hatton. Ah! Sometimes just watching him work, because he's so little, you'd be like, can't believe this little guy just did this. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we, he, he amazes me a lot. Hatton's got it. Oh, man. Wow. What more can you say? He's, he's a leader. I think he's the leader on the court because he's, a, he's silent. You know, he just leads by example, and that's important. It's been everything I thought it would be all the um, fans um, cheering my name and stuff like that and signing autographs and things. I mean, that's all I live for. I, I watched it as a kid growing up seeing all the NBA players and all, and I just wanted to go through and see what it felt like. Jeff D'Amico. You can almost hear the Mets faithful now. Not for nothing, but this team is, you know, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm just saying. Jeremy Schapp reports on an amazing bunch of changes. <laughs> Mets general manager Steve Phillips was so busy during the offseason, he even traded for a new mayor. I'd like to welcome you all here today for the inaugural ceremony of New York City's mayor, controller, and public advocate. The pinstripe mayor is out, and now the Mets are no longer shut out at City Hall. Thanks to their trading spree, they're a lot less likely to be shut out anywhere. We have a guy who has some power. We have a guy who can run. We have a guy who can do the little things like bonding, stealing. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> It's going to be great. The Mets last year scored fewer runs in a full season than any National League team since the expansion Florida Marlins in 1993. But with newcomers Roberto Alomar, Mo Vaughn, Jeremy Burnitz, and Roger Cedeno, the punchless poppers are now sultans of SWAT. We can do some damage. Uh, we can score some runs. You're going to have to decide which one you want to pitch to. Of course, the Mets don't just compete in the NL East. They compete with the Yankees for fans and for headlines. With the Yankees signing Jason Giambi, the Mets needed their own larger-than-life, left-handed hitting former AL MVP at first base. A big bat eager to take a bite out of the Big Apple. We needed some sex appeal. I think that we were, uh, we had a credibility issue with our fans this offseason. Right now, this is the ultimate situation for me. We have a chance to do some great things, put our name up in lights, 
and um, you get a chance to play at home. So there's nothing better than this. The Mets will be instantly better if Vaughn's bat booms after a season lost to a torn arm muscle. And if Edgardo Alfonso's back is better. He spent much of the winter playing lumberjack, trying to loosen his lumbar region. He's hitting the ball with authority. He's moving around really well. So I don't think the health right now is an issue, but it's always a concern. The Mets have molded a murderer's row. Now all those stars simply have to align. The offense is about the heart. It's definitely a little cockiness and a little attitude. I think confidence is a big part of it. I mean, I think all of us are smart enough to know that, you know, talk is very cheap in this game and that you cannot go out there and sort of predict, well, this is, you know, what we're going to do. We're going to go out and blow, guy, blow teams out. It's just, it doesn't work that way. If it doesn't, it won't be for lack of trading. In Port St. Lucie, Florida, Jeremy Schaap, ESPN. Jeremy asked for pressure points for the Mets, as always. Closer Armando Benitez, whose problems with, shall we say, consistency has made him a favorite back page foil for the tabloids. And as Jeremy mentioned, there's Edgardo Alfonso, who must rebound from his off year offensively while moving across the diamond to play third base for the first time in four years, all in the walk year of his contract. And if last year is any indication, the Mets will be relying frequently on their middle relief. No current Mets starting pitcher averaged more than six and two third innings pitched per start in 2001. In fact, Jeff D'Amico ranked dead last in this category among the 98 pitchers with at least 10 starts in the National League. For everything you want to know about the New York Mets, but we're afraid to ask Choo Choo Coleman, log on to ESPN.com. It is there where you can find previews and analysis of every Major League team. In fact, coming up, a special version. Take a look at those bats right there. You see, the length is pretty apparent. And Ray should use a, a, a less length bat. He's not a power hitter. Ray Ordonius is the black one. Mike right. Piazza in the middle there. And Big Mo Vaughn. Mo takes a fastball outside. 1 0. Oh. Well, this is the bat right here. And I tell you what, like Charlie Samuel, this is Old Hickory, which is a new. A new um, a new bat, a bat company, and this bat is hard as a rock. You want to watch that thing? Brings the guy out of line. <laughs> <laughs> this could be a violent move. But this bat really isn't that overly heavy. Mm -hmm. It's not a real big barrel, and it's got a medium handle. He's got the, the, the flare out here. This is a nice bat, actually. You know, if, if you hit me with that, all you're going to do is say I'm sorry. But it's still I'll, buy you, I'll buy you dinner tonight. All right, now, go ahead. <laughs> hit me right in the back of the head. <laughs> Two and one on Mo Vaughn. They said Richie Allen used to use a bat like 44 ounce. Bobby Bonds used a 39 ounce bat. Bobby Bonds. Babe Ruth, they said used 52 ounces. I don't believe that. How do you swing a 52 I I ounce bat? This is playing T ball. Here's the 2 1 pitch. It's a strike, two balls and two strikes. Mo's chewing on that gum. One of the strongest guys in the game right there. Mike Piazza. I can't believe how hard that wood is in that bat. Old Hickory. Why don't they have these bats when I play? <laughs> I should have been born in 65. Not really. Could you swing that bat? I could swing that bat. It's not that heavy. No. I'm telling you. Because Rusty said you're oh. not that strong. Here's a long drive. Right center field. Way back. Side for a ball, 1-0. Oh. 
White looking for his first hit. Fouled out, flied out, grounded out. So the infield's in, the outfield shifts a couple of steps towards the opposite field on Piazza, who.